What does it take to believe in Jesus Christ? I don't mean to just say that you believe. I mean for you to truly believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, born of a virgin, who suffered for the sins of all humans, died on a cross, and was resurrected three days later. We commonly use the word believe to mean different things in different contexts. We can say that we believe something to be true with little or no evidence to back it up, or we can go to extraordinary lengths to determine the veracity of a statement before declaring our belief in it. The English language has Germanic roots, and the leave in believe shares its etymological roots with the word love, as becomes more obvious if you consider the German verb to love, as in the following sentence, ich liebe dich. The Oxford English Dictionary states that the old Teutonic root, which gives us believe, probably had the meaning of to hold estimable, valuable, pleasing, or satisfactory, to be satisfied with, this in turn originating from an Aryan root meaning to hold dear, to like. We can see here how the verb to love shares its roots with the verb to believe, and we also get a better idea of what we mean when we say that we believe something. Our beliefs are dear to us, we hold them in high esteem and are satisfied with them. Accepting our beliefs as true is pleasing to us. Of course, we might hold beliefs that in turn cause us distress, such as believing that the world is about to end, but we can be comfortable with our beliefs regardless of the distress which those beliefs might in turn cause. You will notice that there is no mention of testing our beliefs here, except perhaps in the root meaning of to be satisfied with. And here is another clue to believing. When we are satisfied with our beliefs, we have no automatic drive to explore them, to test them. It is only when we feel uncomfortable that we are exercised to action. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The other side to this is that if anything is done to challenge our beliefs, it will cause us some mental discomfort and exercise us. If someone challenges some belief which we hold dear, gives us comfort and leaves us feeling satisfied, then the very human emotional response is to defend that belief. Once we understand that our beliefs are driven by emotion rather than logic and reason, then we are more prepared to test those beliefs. We are prepared to accept that doing so might make us feel emotionally uncomfortable, and we are prepared to replace beliefs with knowledge, because knowledge begins where belief ends. As we have seen from the very intimate origins of the word itself, belief is a very personal thing. We might believe absolutely anything, and unless we challenge our own beliefs, they are unlikely to change. If someone else challenges our beliefs, we are likely to become emotionally defensive, and if this happens, our reasoning skills are likely to be impaired. It is a fact that our emotional brain drives our fight and flight responses. A challenge to our beliefs is likely to invoke a fight response, and we are then being driven by the need to win the ensuing argument, rather than the need to determine the veracity of our belief. We might look for evidence to defend our belief, and if we find some evidence, it will be embraced by the emotional brain, and this will give it great significance because of the emotional comfort that comes from once again being satisfied with our belief. Whilst searching for that evidence, we might well come across evidence that is contrary to our belief. However, this evidence will not be embraced by our emotional brain. Our emotional defences are already up, and this evidence might well be dismissed out of hand or glossed over. A brief example I came across recently will serve as evidence here. Manito was a Greek-writing Egyptian historian of around the 3rd century BCE. It is not known with any certainty who he was, and none of his original works are extant. Notwithstanding all this, Manito is incredibly important when considering both the history of ancient Egypt and the history of the Jewish people. History is uncovered by the consideration of what evidence is available and comparing ancient testimony. Until the decoding of Egyptian hieroglyphics by Champollion, Manito's testimony was our only real window into Egypt's past. We do not have access to Manito's original works. The evidence we have comes in the later works of other men, including Josephus and Theophilus of Antioch. 
Theophilus, who died around 185 CE, criticized Manito's work in his own Apology to Autoclitus. Theophilus was defending the historicity of the Old Testament and the antiquity of the Jews. Theophilus writes, And Manito, who among the Egyptians gave out a great deal of nonsense, and even impiously charged Moses and the Hebrews who accompanied him with being banished from Egypt on account of leprosy, could give no accurate chronological statement. But when he said they were shepherds and enemies of the Egyptians, he uttered truth indeed, because he was forced to do so. What did Manito actually write about the Hebrews, as reported here by Theophilus? The Hebrews were shepherds, they were enemies of Egypt, they were inflicted with leprosy, they were banished from Egypt. Theophilus accepts two of these statements because they confirm his belief in the Old Testament, and simply dismisses the other two because they do not. This is hardly a rational response. The more balanced response to Manito would be to say that he supported the Old Testament in saying that the Hebrews were shepherds and enemies of Egypt, but contradicted it when he said that they were banished from Egypt for being lepers. Further evidence from either side would then have to be sought to unbalance the argument in favour of either Manito or the Old Testament. It is obvious that Theophilus' desire to uphold his own belief in the veracity of the Old Testament coloured his judgment of the evidence he uncovered. As it happens, one of the statements Theophilus upheld can be dismissed out of hand. Manito was discussing the Hyksos here, which Josephus had mistranslated as shepherds, and Theophilus had run with that translation rather than checking it for himself. In fact, Hyksos in ancient Egyptian meant ruler or rulers of foreign lands, and it was used to identify those invaders of the Nile Delta who held sway over northern Egypt for some 400 years until they were finally expelled by Pharaoh Amos around 1550 BCE. So Manito would now be contradicting the Old Testament three to one, the Old Testament never claiming that the Hebrews were rulers in Egypt. How, I wonder, would Theophilus have dealt with that? Confirmation bias, the tendency to seek out, interpret and remember information in such a way that it confirms our pre-existing beliefs, is a very human trait and a very difficult one to overcome. Scientists are human beings, and prone to confirmation bias just like anyone else. The history of science provides us with evidence that new discoveries and paradigm shifts in scientific thinking often have had to overcome the effects of confirmation bias. The scientific method and peer review helps to eliminate the effects of confirmation bias, and, provided that the research is relevant, the experiment adequate, and the data sufficient and clearly described, any scientific paper in this internet age should find an audience willing to consider it regardless of its conformity. It is possible to apply the rigours of the scientific method to any of our beliefs, and we should all do so on a continual basis. The first question we should ask is, why do we believe what we believe? Our beliefs did not pop into our heads fully formed. They are the product of our environment, upbringing and education. As a child, without access to the reasoning skills which can only come with time and experience, we had no defence against the beliefs of other people, no way of validating their claims or the beliefs which they transmitted to us. As our immature brains developed, making many millions of synaptic connections, hard-coding our beliefs and our worldviews, we readily accepted the beliefs of our parents, guardians, siblings, preachers, teachers, and other authority figures as our own. Many of us might have a memory of when we first questioned something fundamental which we had been told as a fact, but that first questioning is likely to have taken place after many years of unquestioned acceptance of all we were being told. The Jesuit maxim of give me a child until he is seven and I will give you the man holds true to a great extent. Our brains were wired up by other people's beliefs and worldviews long before we developed the intellectual tools to challenge them. And so to claim that our beliefs are our own is nonsensical unless we have taken the time to test those beliefs by applying the rigours of the scientific method to them. Only, of course, then our beliefs will become knowledge. The level of confidence which we have in that knowledge will be based upon how much we have been able to verify what it was we originally held as a belief alone, but we will no longer say simply that we believe something, we will now say that we think something to be true, and we will have the evidence to back up that statement. Knowledge is based on reason, belief on emotion. 
How much we decide to test our beliefs is up to each of us. If a belief we hold has a significant effect on the way we comport ourselves and interact with others and the world in which we live, then I would suggest we owe it to ourselves to test that belief rigorously. Once we accept the possible uncomfortable fact that many of our beliefs are not our own but have been inherited, we are again more open to the need to test those beliefs. If someone questions our beliefs and it makes us feel uncomfortable, understand that is an emotional and not rational response. If our first instinct is to defend our beliefs, that is an emotional and not rational response. If we find ourselves searching for evidence to defend our beliefs, rather than exploring the argument put forward against them, that is an emotional response. If we are willing to accept weak evidence to support our beliefs, whilst dismissing out of hand any evidence against them, that is an emotional response. If the drive to maintain our beliefs is there because our beliefs make us feel good and we are satisfied with them, that is an emotional response. Only when we maintain intellectual integrity and afford all evidence equal time and equal weight can we say that we are acting with reason rather than emotion. We remain free to believe whatever we want, unless, of course, we wish to join any religious church or organisation, in which case said church or organisation will tell us what we must believe in their articles of faith. So, how do you really believe in Jesus Christ? Simple. Ignore this video and continue to be driven by your emotions rather than by reason and logic. Thank you, as always, for watching.